Well, welcome. We're right in the middle of the silly season. And for those of you who are not history buffs, that's the election season. It's when we really find out the people who are willing to put up instead of just talk. Because there's a lot of people in our town that'll tell you what's wrong, what should be fixed, how it should be fixed. And when you say, great, you ready to do something? Oh, no, I don't, I don't do anything. I just complain. Well, tonight we're going to meet somebody who stood up and said, I'd like to make this town better for my kids, for your kids. When I say my kids, I mean all 4,500 of them. So we'll start with an introduction, and then we'll learn a little bit about this special person. Good evening, Al and Milford. I'm, uh, I'm Martin Montoya. Um, I am a <clears throat> new and reluctant candidate for school committee, and uh, I am a, a local townie. Uh, I moved to uh, Milford in 1989, and I uh, attended Milford Public School until I graduated in 99. And um, uh, then I came back here after college in 2003 and started working. And uh, I've been a part of the community ever since, um, as a vendor, as a, as a contractor, as, as a business owner, <clears throat> and um, in most recent times, as a father. Uh, I now have two beautiful baby girls that will be, uh, I hope, attending our public school district in the coming years. Now, you say reluctant candidate. I can't help but pick up on that. <sighs> Politics has never been my purview or forte. Um, in recent years, I have started taking more of my personal time and putting it back into the community. Um, I've been uh, the uh, treasurer of the Milford Cultural Council now for going on three years. And um, I've been able to work directly with the population and um, grantors and grantees to, to bring um, cultural diversity to, to this community. Uh, so the reluctant part is the, the politics. It's one thing to work on an appointed board and it's something else to go out into public and uh, express what your uh, thoughts, wants, needs, and desires are for the community and try to help shape that. So there, there is a little bit of reluctance there. I'm, I'm a little scared. I would, I would be lying if I said otherwise. Well, I'll tip my hat to you because you're putting up your time. You know, as a father of two young ones, every moment is so precious. Um, but there's very few people out of 30-odd thousand people here that'll say, put me in, coach. I can make a difference. So anybody who's willing to donate their time to help our kids, you know, and our kids are 4,500 of them strong, I tip my hat. Martin, I'll start off with the same question I always ask. I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? I'm from Milford too, um, <clears throat> and I don't. I don't mean that in a in a flip sense. Um, I guess what I'm saying is, is my family emigrated to this country and this community um, very early in our lives, and we landed here in Milford looking for the same things that any other family is looking for, uh, safety, security, education, uh, opportunity at the end of the day. Why does that, why, why does that qualify an individual? <clears throat> when you have lived here, you have attended the district, you have participated in the community, you have given of yourself, and you realize that there, are, there is a limit to what kinds of change you can efface. And unless you're willing to take that extra step to put yourself out there um, and try to push for the changes that you believe will benefit the community, then those changes don't come to pass. Um, so I am Milford, and I, I feel that my lived experience and the fact that I am bilingual and I come from a Spanish-speaking household and I, I hold a Mexican passport, I mean, I check all of those boxes, and I was able to build a life to buy and sell businesses and to be able to provide for my family here. And I want my kids to have the same opportunities that I had. And I want everyone's children, all 
4,488 of them <laughs> to be taken care of and given the opportunities to succeed. Now, I've got to ask because townies, some are born here. Like, I didn't choose to come to Milford. I chose to stay. I chose to come back. But I always admire people who made the choice because you could live anywhere. You said you were from New Jersey. So anywhere along the East Coast, you could have settled. Mm -hmm. Why Milford? I think the more poignant question is, why come back to Milford? And we kind of shared this little tidbit before the formal interview started was that, you know, I didn't want to be that townie. When I was 17, 18 years old, the only thing that I could think of is I'm going to go to school. I'm going to go get an education. I am leaving this podunk backwater town. And then I got out. And I lived in Rhode Island, in New York, in New Hampshire, and I came back and I, I traveled. I've been to Europe. I've worked. I've, tra I've traveled for work. I've, I had a lot of exposure and experiences in my 20s that kept driving back. Every time I came back to go to work in Milford or I found myself at my parents' house in Milford or I was near Milford, I was continuously drawn back. And then I look back at my, my life and my experiences and I see this benefit that I derived from Milford. So maybe at 17 or 18 years of age, I didn't have the wherewithal to understand what being in Milford meant. But now as an adult, as, as a homeowner and a business owner, a taxpayer and a father, um, I recognize that this is a unique community that is vibrant in its own right and can offer my children the same types of opportunities that I had. What do you think the three biggest challenges you'd be facing if you're on the school committee? The three biggest challenges, as far as I can see, in order of importance are primarily facilities and student spaces, uh, number one. We still have, uh, we have some new construction, obviously, with Woodland. And, you know, there was some work done that was done about 25 years ago with the rejiggering of Stacy and Middle East. But realistically, other than some minor renovations here and there to Brookside, another one round of it coming up in short order, um, the town hasn't made any major contributions or any initiatives into investing in infrastructure. And that was fine for maybe 1999 through 2010. But in recent years, primarily the last three to five, we've seen some major demographic shifts that are challenging not necessarily our schools, our, our classroom sizes and their populations in and of themselves, but the physical structures that hold these students. We don't have the space to bring in additional programming. We don't have the space to accommodate additional students. So facilities is, is, is priority, priority number one. The second big issue is um, the increasing learning and educational gap between our student demographic populations. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? Anybody who is uh, in the, the, the heavy need category, uh, of which that number is currently at 67.5%, um, it is a, a number that is driven by that demography that I referred to uh, in the last few years because the incoming student body that is being matriculated is facing... English proficiency challenges that are unlike anything the district has seen before. And um, the only way that we're going to be able to close the gap that we're faced with today um, and that same gap that we're going to be faced with 10, 12 years from now when these kids graduate is if we start addressing some of those core demographic shifts today. So the, the second problem is, is definitely how do we address our changing population and how do we ensure that we are offering each and every one of these students the best possible learning experience they can have. The last one, this is something that I'm starting to familiarize myself with, um, is uh, SEL, and this is social and emotional learning. Um, a lot has been made to do since the inception of MCAS on uh, standardized testing, core curriculum, and how we're gonna make sure that reading, writing, and arithmetic are accomplished. And we've made strides to, to, to implement those programs and ensure that our children are receiving those benefits. Where we are lacking is how do we provide opportunity to that uh, high needs population, that 70% I was just talking about. These are kids who may be working. 
They are kids who may have single parent households. They are kids that may be faced with transience or homelessness. They are kids that may be faced with any number of emotional or social disabilities. They are kids that are our kids, but they, by virtue of circumstance, not their choice, have been put into a situation where they may not perform based on the systems that are in place. So that SEL learning is um, basically uh, additional programming that can help these children um, better relate and adopt healthy social and emotional behaviors. It's something that is relatively new um, to curricula and districts, and it's something that I think I believe that the district is pursuing. Let's talk about facilities, your first one. For the first 40 years, I was one of the um, antagonists to our administration saying, why do you need so much more space? You add one child per year. And I used a reference, the first class out of Milford High was 74, mm -hmm. and that was 222. I know the number because I was one of them. Yep. 40 years later, we're graduating 260. Mm -hmm. So simple math says 40 years, 40 kids extra. But the last few years, we've been adding a couple hundred a year. And to put it in perspective, 200 students is half of a memorial. You know, it's a third of Brookside. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at five major schools, average lifetime 40 to 50 years. So every eight to 10 years, there's a school coming. I think we all agree the next one that we've applied for help on is our flagship, the Milford High. What do you think, what should we do with Milford High? Yes. <laughs> she's worked hard. Um, she's a good building with uh, sturdy bones. Uh, I was... Um, <laughs> thankfully, one of the classes that went through before they removed the asbestos, I'm not sure if that was good or bad, but I, I hear you, Al. And, and, and if you're looking at this over a really long time horizon, based on the numbers over the last 40 years, maybe we'd be building a school today. Based on the numbers in the last five years, we kind of needed a school yesterday. Sometimes communities are as much a victim of their success and circumstance as, as they aren't. And what we've seen in those shifts are, like I said earlier, not two-day, one-month, six-month, or one-year commitments. Kids come into the district, and they're typically here for the cycle. Or kids leave the district, and they're typically gone for the cycle. That's the generation that it takes to put that kid from grade one to grade 12. So based on current numbers, even if there is a major demographic shift in five to seven years, and those numbers start to normalize again when we're adding a few kids a year, we still have an immediate base need that needs to be met. Do you have any idea about what you would do if you got to pick what we're doing with the high school? I got to say, I was, um, so I was involved uh, as a contractor for um, the fiber loop that the district uses for technology services amongst all the buildings. I was also involved in some of the planning um, for the new Woodland building during the technology rollout. Uh, and, and what I'll say is I was initially skeptical and I said, hey, we're going to build a school right here and then we're going to knock down the school. And we're going to turn it into fields and parking lot. Everything's going to be fine. It took a while, but everything is fine. Um, there is a lot of unknowns when a community sets forth to undertake one of these large projects. But um, personally, I feel that uh, the campus that contains our flagship is, um, is kind of a gem. It's a little castle on the hill. Uh, Brookside abuts it. There's large, expansive fields in the back. There's a lot of parking space that could be repurposed. You know, it really boils down to what is more economically feasible and more advantageous to the community, or a better way to put it is, how can we maximize the bang for our buck? So I personally would love to see something similar to what was done within Woodland, if I know the costs are significantly higher to, to do a ground up build on a new high school, um, very expensive capital costs. Uh, but 
I kind of, uh, I'm, I'm kind of on the, the, I'm in the camp that is like, listen, if you're going to take the money out and we're going to make a bond and we're going to do this, then we have an obligation as a community to make sure we get the best possible thing we can. If that means we have to spend 40, 50, 60, 70% more to get the new building versus renovating the building, I think it's worth exploring. But to be honest, I have not been privy to the figures or the, the numbers involved in the bids themselves. I haven't had the opportunity to review or read them myself. So, you know, I kind of got to reserve judgment until I'm a little bit closer to that. If you knew the numbers, I'd be a little leery of... The bond. <laughs> because there's been no bids. <laughs> so you're right in the same spot that a lot of people are saying, we built Milford High. It's a bunker. Those walls were built for perpetuity now the fact that we were all excited that it had rotary phones in each classroom <laughs> maybe not so excited today but the walls are still there 100%. so you know we've got the base building the biggest thing that we've run into an issue is if we wanted to do bills from scratch yeah it'd be like 300 million which hurts but where would we do it the only piece of dirt we have that's big enough mm. is asylum street yeah, and that's the, that's the reaction you get thinking, all those kids' cars going up the university streets, the buses going up Route 140, it would take a day and a half to get across Milford with all the buses. So it's going to be interesting when the feasibility study, we got turned down again this year, which is not surprising mm -hmm. um, because Woodland is not that far in our rearview mirror yeah. that there's other towns that are ahead of us. But eventually, we're going to have to make a decision as to um, renovate or build new. So, your second item. Knowledge gap between our disparate demographic populations. Yeah, help me understand that because that's been something that... Now, you mentioned you came from a Spanish-speaking home. Correct. All Spanish or was there English in there too? Well, I mean... You speak English, sure. But I mean, my parents made a conscious effort um, to speak Spanish in our household. That was our primary language. My grandparents, well, I say grandparents, I have one left. Um, when they were present, uh, they didn't speak English. I have uncles and aunts command of the languages, limited. And I have family members in Mexico and Spain and points abroad. Well, you know, it's funny because I never thought about that question till my darling bride came to our house for the first time. Mm -hmm. Looked at me and said, don't you ever speak to your parents in English? And I said, of course. Wait a minute. No. <laughs> <laughs> the only time we speak English so you have company. is when we have company who don't speak Portuguese. Correct. And it was the shocker for me when, you know, they talk about kids assimilating. When I left my house for the first time, I got home. I said, mom, none of these kids know how to speak. I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> Turns out they're all speaking English out there, and I had no idea what that was. Mm. But the town t took us in, and we assimilated, and I don't accept the premise, this is only my opinion, that kids from a non-English speaking home can't do well. 100% in agreement. But now, how do you make it easier? Define easier. Well, when my dad came to Milford, he had had his four years of school in Portugal, because that's what you got before you had to hit the road and start earning to help the family. Um, he had no idea what he should do to support me. I always remember... When I was at like a, a student rally or a function, people would tell my dad, you have to go down to the school and support your son. He had no idea. He put on his hat, put on his coat, and he and his mother, and he and my mother, his wife, would go down there, sit, have no idea what was going on, but all he knew is they were supposed to be there. And it was funny because I could feel it. There was something about the fact 
that they made this effort that really hit me. Hmm. So I always wonder, what can we do to make it smoother, easier, the assimilation faster? Language skills. There is nothing more fundamental to success in society than being able to read, comprehend, interpret, and respond. If you do not have the ability to read and write in English, you will not be able to succeed in this system. That is not to say that the district does not put forth great effort to educate and assimilate, but it becomes a question of you know, where those priorities lie, how those programs are structured, and realistically, what can be done to tweak those things to improve their overall efficacy or output. <clears throat> so I guess what I'm, when I'm thinking about that second question and I'm thinking about the fundamental gap, I have to look at some of the state uh, DOE data. And you have to dig into the fact that, you know, 50.5% of our incoming class members do not speak English at home. That also puts them into the English learning category. Mm -hmm. So if we just take our understanding of the data at hand and we say, listen, these populations statistically underperform in testing in every category because they don't have the language skills, then my, my reaction is, not necessarily what program do we have to create or change, but what types of supplementary services can the district provide these needy populations? And the way that these support services work is we typically ramp up real heavy up front, and then it starts to slide down as the years go by. So if you've got 300 kids enrolled in year one, hopefully by year 10, you know, you're only seeing 50 or 60 students that may still need those elevated services. Um, what am I driving at? What I'm saying is a rising tide lifts all boats. If we can increase and improve the district's ability to teach language and accelerate that assimilation, then we are giving those children greater opportunity down the line. So I think it is imperative that we recognize that there are some fundamental shifts in our student populations and we start to make the course adjustments to make sure that every one of the students in our district has equal access to those opportunities. Now, it's always interesting because one of the things that's thrown in our face is our MCAS scores mm. in comparison to towns around us. Mm. Have you had a chance to look at those at all? <sighs> Remember when I said I wanted to come in with my cheat sheet? <laughs> I have some MCAS data on there. Um, I do not have the MCAS numbers off the top of my head. I don't worry about the exact numbers. Mm. Um, yes, I'm familiar with the performance disparities between ourselves and surrounding communities. Because when my daughter hit the eighth grade, back then middle school least was the home of Tommy Davron. Mm -hmm. And I've always admired him, Is people like Uncle Paul Raftery, because um, they loved the kids beyond question. And one day I decided to tweak Tommy. I was on the parent council and I walked in. I said, Tommy, why do your MCAS numbers suck? I knew I was going to get a reaction. Because <laughs> I'm a the bear out. I, I poked, poked the, bear, the bear. I kicked the bear. I mean, I, you could do nothing more to annoy Tom than to challenge mm. his kids. Because it wasn't my daughter. It was one of his students. Totally. And he looked at me point blank and just said, because you're ignorant. I said, okay, enlighten me. And he walked me through. He said, Al, I'll put our top kids against any town kids. Yeah. But we have a very bimodal distribution. Mm -hmm. And he says, and if you don't understand the effects, I'm going to have you take a test in Mandarin in nine months. Mm -hmm. How do you think you'll do? And it hit me. He goes, what you're looking at is they're normalizing mm -hmm. both Gaussian curves into one. So our le average looks much lower. Mm -hmm. But if you look at our top kids and you look at the advancement of the kids who, they're not low performers, they just haven't learned the language fluently. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? 
I think that um, is poignant and kind of uh, just inter in dovetails nicely with uh, question number two in the sense that if we don't have, teach the language skills at the base level of education, you're not going to get the desired outputs. The MCAS um, is a tool that the state <sighs> designed and put in place. My grade, 1999, the graduating class, we were the first class that were exposed to the MCAS. They had us take it twice, two years back to back, junior, senior year. Didn't count, just took the tests for feedback for the state. Uh, I think it was either 2001 or 2002 where the students actually had to start passing the MCAS to graduate from high school. Um, I don't fault the metrics. Uh, I do question what they measure. I do question how they measure, and I do question how those ratings are assigned to communities. I think it is um, imperative that we recognize that an overall average MCAS score test is representative of those two intersecting curves and the reflection of the demography of the town. So if we have a larger non-English speaking population that is forced to take these tests that perform at historically or traditionally lower rates because they don't have those language skills, that's going to show up in the output. That's going to be in your average. That's going to affect the curve. Does that mean that Milford, to me, as a consumer of this district, is, is better or worse than surrounding communities? No way. I love this town. You don't have a fraction of the services or the facilities that Milford has in many of the surrounding communities. And what matters is not necessarily the MCAS in and of itself, but how we can better prepare our students to excel at it. Now, one of the things, fundamental question, and I, you've, got, you've already given me the answer because you're talking about sending your daughters to Milford school system. Mm -hmm. I sent my daughters to the school system. Mm -hmm. If somebody came up to you and said, will my kids get a good education if they're in the Milford school system? How would you answer it? Absolutely. I would say education and opportunity is like everything else in life. It is incumbent on the participant to seize it. The best that we can do as a district is give access and opportunity and provide guidance and the rails to ensure that these students are on the correct track to potentially matriculate to higher ed or if not get into um, other industries that might suit their future ambitions better. But the bottom line is we as a community and as participants in that district need to work together. I remember when my daughter was in Holliston at preschool, and we were debating because we heard all the negativity about Milford schools. Mm -hmm. And of course, your heart is going one way, but you're reading it. And, and it was Jose Vieira down at Brookside. When I asked him, I said, how do I guarantee my daughter will get the best education she can? And he point blank looked at me and said, get involved. He says, Everything we do pales in comparison to the effects that parents can have by being involved. Do you agree? 100%. So how do we get, and I'll pick on my family, parents like mine, who, God bless, I could not ask for a better support system. But on the other hand, they had no idea what to do. How do we get those parents more involved? This is a difficult question, and I'm going to pick on my family. I was a latchkey kid. I was um, enrolled in Shining Star, and I would walk from whatever school I was in to Shining Star, where I would stay till 5 o'clock, and then I would walk home. Shining Star to Yale Drive. I was a latchkey kid of the 80s and 90s. Why was I a latchkey kid? Well, my father... Um, brilliant man, wonderful human being, did everything, does everything, I should say, does, he's still with us, does everything he can for the family, not a question. Um, but 
work was his priority because if you are not working, then you are not providing food, clothing, <laughs> security. Yeah. Shelter. Yes. Food. Yes. So my father is educated, worked through some really tough times in the pharmaceutical industry. There was a lot of acquisitions in the late 80s and early 90s. And it just seemed that dad was always working in the place that got bought up and then was let go. So there was a lot of transition in that time period. Did that mean that my father didn't want to go to swim meets? Did that mean that my father didn't care about theater? None of those things. It just meant that the family's needs were outside of my immediate needs as a student. My mother, amazing, went back to school. I was a latchkey kid because she wasn't content being a biochemist. She wanted to be an attorney. So she went to BC. And while she was in school, we were out of school. We, we won't hold that against her. Not that at all. That other Jesuit school. <laughs> That's so funny. I ended up going to one myself later in life, but that's a separate story. Um, <laughs> no, it's always, when it comes down to Holy Cross and BC, mm. you have to pick on BC unless <laughs> they're playing football against somebody else. Then the <laughs> Jesuit, they're like cousins. <laughs> yep. y- you have to support them. I mean, they've earned it, but I always laugh when somebody says, well, we went to BC. <laughs> okay, that other Jesuit school. 100%. But... I guess to, to, your, to your question, as an immigrant family, participating in this community, my parents had obligations to maintain the roof over our head and provide for our basic needs, but weren't able to be as active as other students. I mean, when we were really young, mom was like a CCD teacher. So she was all gung-ho about it, and we had just half the neighborhood was over the house all the time. But things change. Family circumstances change now. I had the benefit of having two educated parents that were able to give us an opportunity that I feel isn't an apples to apples comparison with um, some of the, the student populations that we're talking about directly here. And, and what, I'm, what I mean by that is, is when you have a, a family or a household where there's a, a single parent that's operating, you're operating at a deficit from a capital standpoint. 100% all the time. Your obligation is making sure that that rent is paid and that that food is on the table. You know, I don't think it's because mom or dad, maybe they lack the language skills, maybe they don't have the time, maybe they have other commitments. Um, but I think that getting these people involved in their students' lives uh, is going to be easier for some than others. And I don't, I, I, I got to be honest, I don't know off the, the top of my head, if there is a, a simple solution to that question. But to no, hold... could you bring up something that's even more difficult? We were three against two, because my sainted mother lived with us for 30 years. Yeah. So we always had three adults trying to keep up with two kids. We kind of did. <laughs> I think we won more battles than we lost, but... When I see some of, when I coach soccer and you'd see the single moms with two or three kids, yeah. I never understood how they could even barely keep up one against three. And I don't mean it in a negative way. It's just every one of them had a soccer game. Every one of them had an after-school activity. Just amazed me how the mother, because predominantly in my team it was single mothers. Mm-hmm. There's only one single father. How they kept up. Now, school choice. Have you had a chance to look at that yet? I had a chance to talk um, briefly with a couple of different people um, within the district offices. And um, I guess the, the, a better way to frame the question is, what do you think about school choice deficit? Yes. Um, Why? In prior years, prior to these demographic shifts that we've been discussing, um, school choice has had a net export of maybe 10 to 20 students per and per grade level. I want to say that that proportion of the population is somewhere out around 200 or so students. I don't have that exact number. I know we've got, we've got close we've got, enough. It's a million dollars. Absolutely. Because every student that exits is those dollars traveling to the district Go where they're going to be educated. Correct. 
And the deficit has been run because we had more students exiting the district than we had coming into the district, which was the case up until a couple of years ago. So in years prior, um, from what I understand, the district did have some outreach programs on trying to get some of those kids back in. But again, we talk about the sticky nature of these decisions, physically moving or choosing to educate yourself elsewhere. They tend to be generational shifts. There's a 70 to 80% chance that once they're out, they're out. Once they're in, they're in. It really isn't going to change unless there's a major life change within that family. So if we kind of understand the, the behaviors associated with school choice and its um, regularity in terms of how those dollars exited the district, um, I don't have any direct involvement in trying to recapture that or any exposure to this, really. Uh, but I think the sentiment within the district has been, if none of these students left, we already would have built a new school. That's issue number one right on top. So if, the, if that money had stayed local and those students never went anywhere, we would have already been building a new school. We, we, this, this conversation about new buildings and district facilities would have occurred five, seven years ago. Outside of that, um, in the last few years, because of immigration and demography, the, and the, the associated funding with it, that school choice deficit, oh, we need a new school. <laughs> so um, I don't have any strong feelings about school choice in and of itself. I, I believe in uh, a family's right to, to educate or find the programs that suit them. And let's, let's discuss what school choice really means. It means you are choosing potentially private, potentially parochial, potentially choosing to a different district, potentially homeschooling. There could be life circumstances involved in it. Not every head that leaves the district has the same rationale. Right. So, so you know, the school choice kind of took on a pejorative in the sense that, oh, it's this, it's this thing that we have, to, we have to deal with and contend. And you're 100% correct. You know, seven years ago, that was, that was the, the question du jour. Today, uh, we don't even have space for the kids we have. Um, I think the, the, the question of is school choice good or bad or what its overall fiscal impact is on the district has kind of been overshadowed by the, the more immediate demographic concerns. Yeah, and it, realistically, people have to understand, you can make a conscious decision to stop school choice in. Sure. You don't have the right to, to stop, stop school choice out. Correct. So yeah, for a long time, we believed Woodland was kind of shaky. And that's funny because when it first came in, it was the shining star of the schools. Yep. The elite teachers were picked and it was they, all They went to Woodland. And then all of a sudden, it became the last choice you want. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole idea of busing kids. Mm -hmm. And I always laughed because, you know, when you think of Boston, you were busing them to very different environments. The furthest school away is, what, one mile? Mm. You know, if you look at Memorial, Brookside, and Woodland, oh. less than a mile apart. There's I, no different environment. I think you're, you're, you're referring to the, the old program, which was community schooling. Yes. And this was, actually, I went, I went through the, the vestiges uh, the, at the tail end of community schooling. Like, when I, I was a Brookside kid, not a Woodland kid, um, and there were definitely some social and class things going on there. Like, way beyond me at the ripe old age of eight. Safe to say. <laughs> I was just trying to be, like, not different, to be honest, right. at eight years I old. I just want to be accepted. Yes. <laughs> That's, that was concern number one. Like, how do I make myself not this different? Um, you know, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so to your point, I don't, uh, I don't have any really strong feelings on, on the reorganization of the district. I think the transition from community schooling to busing between regions was more a function of necessity because of a changing and expanding population. Less a question of, well, we're just going to put all the kids who live near this school in here and this school near here and this school near there. Well, you're right, because realistically, all those kids that live here, well, the other kids live, I mean, it was a mile different. Mm -hmm. So if you sit there and say, well, wait a minute, if you took the 495 side of Milford, well, do they go to Memorial or Brookside or Woodland? Totally. It, by the time you measure it, it's normalized. One hundred percent. But I, but that's that's a geographic question. I think, and like I said, I was probably eight or nine years old when I when I came to the school district. I wasn't thinking about 
what the total systemic load is on this ecosystem. Because if I have two buildings and I have like teachers and like programming, I am duplicating the same amount of effort. If I consolidate those or break up the, the, the buildings into different ranges of populations, right. then I can teach more students more accurately to the need. And, and that, this was, this was just a growing town faced with the realities of an inefficient district that was duplicating a lot of its efforts and had to fundamentally change. You know, it's funny because the big thing on the busing was there was this study that proved, and I learned about North Milford. I had never heard of North Milford till I went to the high school for this forum. The face on my back. I, I, I actually asked the woman next to me, we have a North Milford? And she goes, well, you must not be from Milford. I said, well, I just moved here because I would moved back two uh -huh. years. Could you explain to me what's North Milford? And the woman had this wonderful explanation. Till I asked her, I said, okay, where's the heights? She goes, the what? I said, the plains? You know, and it's like, okay. She, it was like, give me a break. <laughs> Milford is not that big that we have a north and south and east. and So a lot of it was confusing to me. So I went to Woodland, and I read the story the study mm -hmm. that showed that, you know, the um, resources all went to the woodland area. Yeah. And what I learned was really surprising from the fact that I looked and I said, there's no difference. Mm -hmm. And I went back to the meeting the next time and I said, I'm curious, do you know that a third of our valedictorians come from woodland? And people said, see, we told you. I said, yeah. And you know where the other third comes from? Memorial, and the other third comes from Brookside. So I'm totally confused as to where, and it turns out it was a socioeconomic study. Hmm. You know, income, mm -hmm. how, many, how many TVs, do you have a computer? Yep. And I sat there and said, wait a minute, where's the performance hmm. edge that Woodland has? They didn't. Yep. All the kids, it normalized out. And it made me feel better. Because I don't want to know that one third of our kids are being treated better than the others. Now, one of the things you read, unfortunately, about schools is the security issues. Mm -hmm. We had a very controversial vote, now it's a few years ago, to put SWAT members in the schools. Any opinion? It's not prepared for this one. Um, you can't prepare. This comes from the gut as a father. This is a very contentious subject. And what I mean by that is, is what do we want our schools to physically be? What aspects of us as a people and a society, do we want this building to reflect? I graduated in 99. That was also the same year of the first televised mass whore, um, Columbine. That event fundamentally changed the discourse about what it meant to be a secure, safe place. Because for, I would say, the average person, we all want to say that this school is akin to a library or a hall or any other major civic or social location where community members can congregate and be together and be safe. I've, um, I've accepted um, the community policing. I've accepted truancy officers. I, find, I think there are there are ways and systems and services and policies that can, put, that can be put in place to mitigate risk. Um, do I believe that we need a SWAT team in Milford High? Even after, as a contractor, I had to pull video footage for a stabbing? 
In Milford. Oh yeah, it's like 2004, 2005. It was, it was a stabbing right in the right in the um uh, in the the foyer outside of the gym. Mm-hmm. Totally. Security and safe spaces and your ability to access them are always going to be opposing forces. Um, it would take a lot for me to, to, to get to that point, even, even as a father. I would actually say I probably have pretty liberal um, non-helicopter parenting, <laughs> parenting <laughs> styles in the house. It's like, oh, I heard something fall. You think the toddler's okay? I better go look in the kitchen. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know. Well, I remember struggling with this decision. Mm. And I was vice chair at the time of the FinCom. Chairman was Chris Morin. And I looked at him right after one sentence. We have a SWAT team that we participate in, a regional, and they can get to Milford within 40 minutes of being called. The average incident is over in 18. And I remember looking at Chris saying, God help us if we say no and something happens. As much as I don't want armed men walking through you know, the schools, it's like, I don't want firemen in our town. I don't want policemen in our town till I need them. You know, when there's a fire, I want Chief Mark and his crew to be there right away. Mm-hmm. You know, if there's an issue, I want Chief Falvey and Robbie Tassino and their crews to be there. But it was tough because I could see the benefits that kids grow up having friends. I mean, this resource officers at um, Milford High get to know a lot of the kids. Totally. And it makes the kids more comfortable. But again, the idea of any guns in the school scares the heck out of me. Yeah. You know, and I hope that they are as bored as bored could ever be for the rest of their tenure. Thankfully. um, Do you think Milford has a safe school environment? Yes. Even though somebody got stabbed? Violence is a risk. There is nothing... um, there is nothing in this world. There is no insurance policy. There is no, there is no prayer. There is no hope that can indemnify you from potential bad happenings. That doesn't mean that we want them. That doesn't mean that we seek them out. That doesn't mean that we solicit them. But at the end of the day, you have to make a calculated decision as to the balance between having a society that you want to participate in and one that is too scary to comprehend. And, and, and I got to be honest, um, I didn't travel internationally alone as an adult until I was 25. I went down to the Dominican Republic and I was visiting friends and family. And uh, let's just say um, seeing an armed guard with an MP5 all over the place, you get used to it. But I guess what I'm saying to you, Al, is as a, as a participant in this society, I have, I have never felt that compulsion or that need. And I don't want to foist that upon young children who, who really don't, don't have any business being around that. One of the things that Milford has lean towards is extra resources for special needs kids. Yes. Um, We've been criticized for it by some residents, Mm -hmm. saying that because of all the programs, we encourage people to come here with special needs kids. We encourage people from other towns to come here. What's your opinion of our SPED program? It's the best in the state. Yes. Um. I want to speak a little bit to that misconception. And I, I just want to dig into some of the DOE uh, statistics and kind of talk a little bit about what, that, what it means for that need. Statistically speaking, there is not a breath of a difference between Milford and Hopkinton and Holliston and Boston. The SPED, specific special education disabilities, block is around, I think I want to say it's like 16.9 or 7. It's right around 17%. And if you kind of look at the surrounding communities data through the DOE's website, you can see that that general percentage holds true. 
across the populations in all the school districts, even if we're not apples to apples. Things start to get weird when you start looking at poverty, and things start to get really strange when you start looking at the language gaps and deficits. Um, and what we're really talking about is the perception that Milford has wasted all of this money educating what, I guess, um, the complainers would uh, conceive as people not worthy of education. Um, I, I take issue with mm. that. That it makes is, my skin crawl. It's unacceptable. Listen, we have a statutory obligation, not we. Anybody who participates in the school committee has a statutory obligation to ensure that all students enrolled in your district have access to education. My goal is to make that as equitable as possible. My daughter once explained it to me in a way that really hit home. She's involved with the special best buddies and special Olympics. And she said, Dad, my job is to get every child that's entrusted to me to their potential, maybe a little bit more. But I have to understand that not all my kids have the same potential. Doesn't mean I try any less, but I'm going to push them to get to the highest level they can. That's amazing. And that hit me to say, yeah, you get it. That's what we should do. Mm -hmm. And if we, I mean, I'm just voicing my opinion. If we happen to help some other kids that are not Milford kids along mm -hmm. the way, I don't think there's anything wrong. Nothing. I think, I think one could um, expound on that a little bit more. There's a lot of institutional knowledge that goes into running these programs, that goes into creating the metrics, that goes into following these students, that goes into reading that data so you can say, hey, this is or this isn't working. I guess what I'm saying is because of the strong credentials that Milford brings to the table in terms of its um, programming, Instead of complaining about it, why don't you capitalize on it? Learn from those experiences. Take the systems that you have put in place and maybe you reshape them. Maybe you take some of the things we've learned from dealing with this particular population and apply it to another. Because you know what? We got hundreds of kids who can't speak English. That is a pressing concern. If we don't address that as soon as possible, that whole by the time they're coming in the first grade and they're leaving in the 12th grade and not passing the MCAS, ow, they're not going to pass the MCAS. So we have to do everything that we can uh, and to ensure that these students get those language skills. Well, you know, it's funny because you, me, people from Milford, we have a jaundiced view at how well of an education the kids get. Because mm -hmm. they're our kids. Totally. All 4,400, I say 4,500, it's easy to remember. <laughs> But the real judge in my mind, and I've told Kevin and I've told Rob Trombley before him, yeah. you don't count as a judge because you have a jaundiced opinion. The people who count are the colleges and the companies who accept mm -hmm. or don't accept our graduates. And when my daughter applied and got into every school she applied to, and I mean, my oldest did, she did good. She had that. Second semester, junior year, where she got a B plus, we accused her of goofing off too much. <laughs> but her worst semester the last three years was a 395, so I couldn't complain too much. Nope. Did fine. And I sit there and say, I can't be upset that Milford didn't give her the credentials to apply because she got in everywhere mm -hmm. and didn't give her the background to compete. Because when your worst semester is a 395, yeah. It's pretty sterling. You know, you sit there and say, the school system did their job. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, you're on the school committee, they say you have one thing you could change. You're the king. Wave the magic wand and tell us what would you change about the school system. Oof. What would you change about the school system? Would you bring in a new program? Would you... I mean, we've already talked about buildings. Yeah, I, I think um, I would probably circle back to the, the conversation we just had about Milford's well-storied expertise in um, supportive education. And, and I know it sounds like a, I'm sorry, I sound like a broken record coming back to this whole question of 
what our student population is comprised of, what their language skills are comprised of, and what that means for these kids who are enrolling and matriculating to the district. Um, if I could wave that magic wand, I would try to take every last morsel of information that we have learned from putting together some of the best programs in the state, and I would apply them to what we can improve in ESOL and ELL. How can we take this gargantuan dilemma that we've been presented with as a district, utilize the resources that the state and the federal government have put forth, and give these students the best possible education we can? And back to that broken record. I know, I know it sounds like it, but it's, 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 it's that reading and writing. It's that comprehension. If we, if, if, if we can move that needle 10 points in 10 years, I, I, that, happy, happy man. Coming down to the point where I'm going to ask you, Martin, I'm from Milford. Why should I vote for you? <sighs> I am, uh, I am Milford. I'm a product of Milford. Uh, my living experience, my educational experience, my work experience, um, and now even my home and my family. Uh, as much as it pained me when I was 17, 18 years old, I have assumed the man mantle of the townie, and I look at my life, and I look at myself in the mirror, and I say, you know what? We did all right. We, 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 we struggle, just like everybody else does. We all have our, 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 our issues, but at the end of the day, I want my children to have as much, and if not more, opportunity from this district. That, that's why I Thank you. You know, it's always interesting because growing up here, you had the rivalries. Mm -hmm. The kids from the Plains, the kids from Luby Ave, the kids from the Heights. I used to laugh and think of Water Street as the great unifier. Because when we went to the Hopedale Band concerts, Everyone was the same. as soon as we went over that hill, you turned your hat around and everybody was Milford. <laughs> so anybody picks on a kid from the Heights, a Luby Ave kid was right there with them. That's hilarious. Defending them. Of course, we, at the end of the night, concert's over, we come back over, turn the hat around, okay, get back to the DDF. <laughs> but that was Milford. It yeah. was the center of our universe, continues to be the center of many of our universes. And I thank you for stepping up. And as always, I'll never ask you to vote. I've always promised never to ask you to vote for a specific candidate. But I'll beg you, get out and vote. Take advantage of the forums that are done. Take advantage of the TV shows and the interviews. Get to know the candidates because more than any other board in this town, the school committee controls seven hours of your children's life every day and dictates what skill sets they're going to carry with them the rest of their life. So to me, and there's no data on it, but... School committee is the most important position that any parent can vote for. So please get out and vote. And to our six loyal viewers, I thank you. God bless, and may tomorrow be a better night than tonight. Thank you again.